Please state your name followed by the pound sign. Your line has been muted. Give you a general idea of how our program started and how it has kind of recently changed. I think it's these changes that have really allowed us to integrate the alternative plans into our TMDL program more easily. Uh oh. Page up and page down. I'm trying. There we go. All right. Okay, so about 17 years ago, our TMDL program started with four regional watershed liaisons and the establishment of a few low staff regional field offices for surface water programs. On the map shown, the purple and orange areas each had one person. The blue area, which includes the major cities of Fargo and Grand Forks, had three people. One for surface water, one for waste management, and one for air quality. And the green area includes Bismarck, which is our capital city and holds most of the major government offices, including our environmental health section offices, which Division of Water Quality is part of. Um, these field offices were created to provide a face and a constant contact for local stakeholders as we develop TMDLs and assessments and Section 319 projects. Uh, the regional field offices provided a small-scale connection to the landscape and economies as well for each area. I've been kind of included photos there to show you the differences of the landscapes in the different areas. As a side note, uh, our recent oil boom and oil development, that occurs on the western edge of the state that includes parts of both the purple and the orange areas. So each watershed liaison worked with their own region to develop contacts and make connections to help educate the public on a variety of water quality programs. To give you an idea of scale, my initial area was the purple area to the north, which is about 280 miles by 150 miles, or roughly 42,000 square miles. Um, through staff turnover through the years, um, I was also assigned parts of the green and blue area. So my area grew to roughly about 60,000 square miles. Um, there was some overlap between regions and other monitoring staff occasionally assisted with the TMDL development, but mostly uh, each liaison had their own region and worked independently within it. And our approach to prioritization was basically to just address the TMDLs based on ease of completion and uh, level of local interest. So today, our staff is basically the same size. There are still four TMDL positions. Um, they have now been renamed Regional Basin Coordinators, since we now work with many more programs besides just TMDLs. But we seem to only be able to keep about three positions filled at a time. Unfortunately, as it usually goes, the workload has greatly increased, both due to oil development and the addition of new areas of concern and public interest in our programs. And also the governor has recently asked us to cut our budget again by 10% this next biennium, and this was after last biennium's cut of 25%, and also to reduce our FTEs by 5%. Uh, the whole environmental section for North Dakota has 150 FTEs, so losing to 77 to eight people is, is gonna be kind of tough, but I know this is nothing new to most of you. Everyone goes through this all the time, but it does kind of go to why we decided to do alternate plans. So I know this slide is, is pretty busy, but I wanted more of a visual than words on, on the different things that these new basin coordinators do. So in addition to writing TMDLs, we're also responsible for implementing the Section 319 program, which includes acting as designated project managers. Uh, we provide education and outreach for a variety of surface water programs. We do some ambient and TMDL monitoring and occasional complaint response and spill response. Uh, in addition to that, we have individually been assigned specific tasks. So since I am kind of on the north border area, I work with international watershed groups in Manitoba and Saskatchewan in Canada. And then I, I'm also kind of responsible for researching new models and doing model development, as well as working to help in the development of our new HABS program, Harmful Algal Bloom. Um, we just started that a couple of years ago as far as response and websites and things like that. So the coordinator along the eastern edge, and that again was along in through the cities of Fargo and Grand Forks, kind of our more metropolitan area, if you can get that in North Dakota. Um, he works with a variety of groups in, in Canada and Minnesota as well. And his job is also to kind of work on how we can market our message to get it out to the public more effectively, to get them more involved in a lot of the conservation programs. And then the coordinator in Bismarck, he assists the 319 program manager with the GRITS data and with our education programs like EcoEd and Biothon, Project WET, 
um, as well as producing articles for water magazines and speaking on the radio and TV. So those were the usual tasks, and over the last couple of years, we had four new additions to the workload, and they all pretty much occurred simultaneously, and that's uh, nutrient criteria development and strategy, the new basement management framework, which is how we're going to approach um, implementing our different surface water programs, at the TMDL vision, and then a move from our Department of Health to our own Department of Water Quality. So I'll go briefly into each of these as they're kind of building blocks that led to our interest in alternative plans. Um, so we'll go back, well, I'll start with nutrient criteria development. Um, the Water Quality Division decided to approach the nutrient criteria development strategy by creating five work groups of stakeholders that had an interest in nutrient criteria to begin to tease out the different components of the strategy. These included local, county, state, tribal, federal agencies. Um, we called in producer groups like the North Dakota Soybean Growers, the Red River Valley Sugar Beet Growers, North Dakota Stockman's Association, et cetera. Also invited city entities, Canada and Minnesota representatives, engineering firms, water resource boards, conservation groups, and pretty much anybody else we could think of that would have kind of a stakeholder interest in, in the area and in nutrient management. Um, this was the first time really outside of the Section 319 task force that the Water Quality Division really um, emphasized bringing in a wide variety of stakeholders to help brainstorm solutions and, and priorities. And happily, as it was our first time, it was very successful. And we were able to work with a variety of work groups, and they really helped us in the creation of our nutrient strategy. And we continue to work with them on the, as the nutrient, nutrient criteria are developed. And actually, this week, we have two stakeholder meetings um, on the nutrient strategy where we have invited the stakeholders back to help us um, kind of provide specific nutrient reduction actions and strategies around uh, four different source categories. And the first one that we had on Tuesday was actually pretty well attended, and we got a lot of great ideas out of it. And the, another one is going on today, actually. So then the next project was our uh, Basin Water Quality Management Framework. Uh, the Watershed Management Program recognized that the implementation of water quality programs on kind of a random statewide basis had led to a lack of watershed priorities and an inefficient allocation of limited resources, both technical and financial. Recognizing that other states had moved towards a rotating basin type of plan for a lot of their programs, uh, we decided to kind of create a similar framework for the implementation and better integration of different water quality programs. And this kind of also goes to the funding situation we're in. You know, as always, you have to do more with less. And so we were looking at ways to better utilize both our staff and technical resources as well as our financial resources. Um, another desire was that as we transitioned to the Department of Environmental Quality, there would be a greater connection to the people in the state to create a more targeted program with clear goals and outcomes and the ability to more accurately and consistently transmit data results and success stories back to the stakeholders that are involved. Um, Previously, we have always kind of been under the radar. I mean, we're a small group in terms of state government and being part of the overall health department that deals with, you know, births and immunizations and, and restaurant inspections and all the rest of that. You know, we've kind of stayed under the radar. But with this transition to our own department, um, definitely getting a lot more attention from people statewide. And so we wanted to try and make that um, more focused on the positive things that we're doing instead of you know, the fear and dread that yet one more government agency is coming to control them. So for this new framework, the state was divided into five basins, and it's very similar to the previous four regions of the TMDL liaisons. Um, we just thought a five-year plan would be a little bit easier than just a four-year one, so that's kind of why we went with the five basins. Um, so each basin will develop a five-year watershed plan it sets priorities for water quality improvement and protection and will be addressed by state DEQ staff on a rotating basis. So each year we're going to have the primary focus is going to, going to be on a different basin, but all basins will participate all the time. Um, the state staff would then work as a team to assist. Oh, wait, along with this, we created uh, 
basin stakeholder advisory groups for each basin. And so that's made up of a lot of the same local stakeholders that we had come together for the nutrient strategy. And they are specific to each basin because we figured those would be the groups that would better understand the concerns, needs, priorities, economic factors and stuff in that area. Um, so then each, then the state staff would work as a team to assist these advisory groups in the development and revision of the five-year plan. Under the original organization the, with the TMDL liaisons, um, if, you know, we pretty much stayed to our own area. So if you were busy, we missed a meeting and, and that was it. We really didn't cross over a whole lot. We are hoping by kind of making this more of a team effort and a rotating effort that they're always going to have a familiar face available. They're going to know all, hopefully four of us, three of us currently. And so whichever one of us is called into a meeting, they will be familiar with us and, and know how to work with us. Also decisions on selecting watersheds for priorities previously have been made just at the Bismarck office level without any input from local groups at all. And so it was basically our decision based on a few people on where we would go and what our priorities would be. So with this new approach, uh, we hope that it's gonna better integrate between programs and have more success in implementation as local groups have kind of more buy-in to the projects. Um, finally, we had the new TMDL vision and priority documents that came and so we switched to a vision instead of a pace, which was good for us. And while the nutrient strategy gave us the experience in organizing large group of stakeholders for decision making and a common purpose, it was also discovered through a lot of these meetings that those in the watershed that had already worked towards improving water quality, you know, they wanted recognition. Um, the basin management framework helped us focus on those stakeholder groups again locally and to drive improvements in the watershed more effectively. So when the TMDL vision process came in, it made us focus on setting TMDL priorities and realizing the limitations that we had with our small staff and how we could kind of overcome some of those limitations. Um, the division also recognized that most of the relatively easy to complete TMDLs were already done. We did those right away. And so we were kind of data poor on a lot of the ones that were still on the list. And we, we knew we had to come up with a way to kind of figure out how to collect data for that as well. Um, overall, our priorities were set to have staff work on the, to have like our TMDL staff work on the completion of TMDLs where data were available, but no implementation programs had been initiated and then work towards gathering more data for the data poor impairment in the long term. So why alternative plans? Um, we understood that they were not TMDL replacements by any means. Um, and with the budget and staffing shortfalls that we have, you might wonder why we decided to do something that wasn't required. And though we do have limited staff and it does create some ob obvious difficulties, we thought there was also some benefits to it as well. And the biggest benefit that we had is that our surface water programs have the integration that a lot of states don't, especially our integration between TMDL and Section 319 non-point source programs. And those two programs are really key to our alternate plans. And with the move towards the basin framework and the TMDL vision, our integration with other programs like permits is improving greatly as well. So alternate plans, the, the kind of the goal of the whole TMDL process anyways, the division has always felt that the most important goal for a watershed management program is to restore water quality of impaired waters. You know, we want to have that action, have that movement towards being able to delist those waters. That was the, the ultimate goal of, of anything that we did. So when we had limited resources, our TMDL pace was very small. We had not a lot of staff, and especially compared to the, a lot of the other states in our region, like Montana and Wyoming, it was our pace was very small. Um, however, participation in our Section 319 non-point source program is one of the largest in our region. So by creating alternate plans that are based on Section 319 watershed projects, we could show that while large numbers of TMDL reports were not being completed, we were moving towards the ultimate goal of the TMDL program, which is on the ground implementation to restore impairments. We kind of wanted credit, as it were, from EPA in Washington for things that didn't show up normally as, as TMDL beans that have been counted in the past. 
And we felt that the changing climate towards the environmental programs, especially with our move towards DEQ, it was important to be able to have this forward progress documented somewhere, knowing that we could, that we would need to revisit, you know, and make sure that progress towards restoration was happening, that this wasn't an instead of sort of a thing. So using tools other than TMDLs, and using these tools in some cases where TMDLs can't easily be written for us, such as nutrients, nutrients are a big problem for us, but we don't have numeric nutrient criteria yet. Um, we thought using alternate plans would help free up time for unlimited staff to write the TMDLs that were not appropriate for alternative plans. So, like I said, North Dakota's alternate plans focus on non-point source pollution only. That's all we write them for. No point sources, if, it's a point, if there's a point source involved anywhere, then it will moves to the full written TMDL with submittal. And we're using our Section 319 programs and projects as a vehicle. So for watershed projects that incorporate an impaired water body and are already underway, the project implementation plan, or the PIP, is modified to incorporate the components of an alternate plan, as specified by EPA. To do this, uh, we create an introductory paragraph. Uh, so I take the PIP that has been submitted and approved for a grant, I create an introductory paragraph that's put at the top of it. Um, we use EPA's summary of alternate plan considerations. They have eight different considerations that they would like to be in any alternate plan. And we create a crosswalk between the two so that I point out to them where each of those things can be found within the PIP so that it's easy for them to determine whether or not it kind of meets their idea of an alternate plan. Um, we have also rewritten the guidance document for future Section 319 PIPs to more specifically address considerations of the EPA document so that they will work as an alternate plan if implementation occurs before the TMDL is written. So the idea there was that if we can get some of these just in the regular format, it's going to save me time down the road because all I have to do is add the crosswalk, add a summary paragraph, and if you know, it's an impaired water body and it's already moving towards implementation, we can just go ahead and submit that as an alternate plan. Also, since alternate plans are not submitted instead of TMDLs, if a water body is not meeting beneficial uses after an appropriate period of time, a TMDL will be written, and we write that out quite plainly in the document to EPA. The benefit of the 319 PIP is that it also has a monitoring component, so data is collected during the project and under under the alternate plan status. And this data could then be used to complete a TMDL without a separate monitoring plan being established if you know a TMDL is needed later on. So this was a way to kind of get at some of our data needs is that we could use this money from 319 because they were collecting the data already. And then if it turns out that we still needed to write a TMDL at the end of it, we could do it and we would have data available. Also, a benefit is that using the PIP is, it save, like I said, saves staff time because it's, it's created by the project sponsor. So they're the ones that put all the different parts together. We just kind of have to review it and make sure that it fits. And that was the idea with rewriting the guidance as well. All the plans that I've done so far, the information is included somewhere in the PIP. So it's just a matter of pointing it out. We wanted to specifically spell out what we wanted the project sponsors to include in which sections so it would be easier to find in the future going forward. So the other thing was alternate, alternative plans as recognition, and I kind of mentioned this uh, briefly before. Um, it kind of relates back to our nutrient strategy and the bracing framework stuff that we did with stakeholders. Um, you know, they had mentioned that they thought that we could further things along in terms of implementation, improving water quality, if we did more towards recognizing the efforts that were already going on within the different watersheds. Um, so one of the best ways to encourage more involvement in improving water quality is to recognize this work. It is also felt that some projects are promoted for potential benefits, accomplished, and then never discussed again to really look at if they were successful or not. So by keeping the alternate plans on the forefront of both the TMDL and 319 programs, we can address these concerns as well. And it's our plan to identi identify alternate plans on our website, 
so that it's front and center there. Um, they will be identified anytime there's a discussion of TMDLs in any of those meetings as well. We are looking to uh, produce some public service announcements for the radio newspapers. It was suggested that we do that, especially around the morning farm report times, because that's when I probably have our greatest audience. Since most are, you know, these are going to be resulting on non point source pollution. So we're looking into creating some of those as well to try to get more interest and in then to recognize the work that's already being done. Because overall, it's our hope that the more stakeholders feel appreciated and valued, the more likely they are to spread the word about the programs that we have and participate in them. So alternative plans to date. Uh, overall, EPA has been generally supportive of our approach. There was quite a bit of discussion about how TMDLs will be written if the alternative plan doesn't result in restoration of, of water quality. There's currently no set time limit on how long we'll let that alternative plan go. Um, but the general idea right now is that as long as there's work being done in the watershed and as long as we can document water quality improvement over time, and you know that's part of the 319 uh, project as well as that they come up with water quality reports, so we'll have those reports available. As long as we can kind of document document forward progress, then we can hold off on writing the TMDL. If for some reason the 319 project shows that there's not an improvement in water quality, which we would hope that's not the case, but if that happens, um, at that time we'll go ahead and take whatever data we have and, and write the full-on TMDL with, with load reductions and the rest of it. Um, like I said, those water quality reports are also done by the project sponsors as part of 319, so it's not an additional burden on our TMDL writing staff. And then there's also some discussion about what process we would use to update EPA on the status of them, kind of how to keep track of them and let EPA know that they're moving forward, that we're looking at them, that we're reviewing data. And it was decided that for now, um, it would just be discussed as part of our overall vision each year as we as we review those um, vision requirements that we've set out. So to date, we have two alternate plans that have been kind of quote accepted by EPA. I put the accepted in quotes because they're not really a TMDL, so they're not formally approved as such, but EPA has said, yes, you've addressed all our concerns and considerations in our table, so we'll, we'll take this as an alternative plan for now. Uh, three more are going to be submitted by the end of this week, and we have four more scheduled for completion um, by the end of fiscal year 2018. The changes to the requirements for the, on the Section 319 PIP guidance is in place, and so it will be there before the next round of grant submission, which is this summer. And we just hope that this is going to help streamline the process even more. So to summarize, um, we are using slightly modified Section 319 PIPs as the plans, but only for non-point source. There's point sources we'll write a TMDL. It allows TMDL staff to prioritize writing where they need to write, and if implementation is occurring, we're just going to let that occur because that's what we want to happen anyways. Um, it's also a way of showing progress towards restoration of impaired waters, um, both to EPA, national legislatures, and our stakeholders. A way of recognizing for stakeholders that they have put in time and money into watershed improvements, and it allows us to bring together the components of our nutrient management strategy, our basin management framework, and our TMDL vision process as well. So that is all that I have. Great, thanks. Um, we have a couple questions, and if you have any more, please um, send them in through the chat box. Uh, so the first question is, um, what scale are your PIP and alternative plans written at, and do you have an entire, or do you do an entire basin at a time, or are written for a smaller scale? They are all written for a smaller scale, usually a 12-digit hook, sometimes a 10-digit hook, but at the much smaller scale right now. All right, and um, another question on the PIPs. Um, are they the same as the Section 319 watershed-based plans with the nine critical elements? Basically, yes. 
And we are trying to integrate those two things as well. We're working on that. I just got a, a letter the other day from our 319 project manager. Um, the PIPs are the plans that they actually submit as a grant proposal that talks about their goals and objectives and tasks and what they're going to complete. But yeah, the idea is that they'll have the same as the overall watershed plans as well with the nine, nine critical categories. Okay. Um, any other questions for Heather? All right, and if you do have any follow-up questions, there'll be another opportunity possibly at the end of the webinar and in the exit survey. Uh, so thanks, Heather. Um, Thank you. And next up, I will be going to uh, Cam McNutt from the uh, state of North Carolina. Can you hear me? I think I gave you control now. Um, All right. Do I need to go full screen? I'm not seeing full screen. Um, there you are. Yep. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Cam McNutt. I'm from North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. We recently just had that name change as well. I'm in the modeling and assessment branch, and we do TMDLs and 303D list and the like. Um, Luckily, a lot of what Heather covered, I could have covered as well in our state, with the exception of we have 17 river basins, but we kind of operate the same way. So luckily for you, I'm going to give you a few slides on kind of our overall approach, and then I'm going to show you some of the nuts and bolts about how we're actually addressing the nine different elements and the, of the alternative plans, and also talk about the 4B demonstration components. Okay, page down. So one of the approaches that we're taking is we're really emphasizing 4B demonstrations, and we've been kind of doing a lot of presentations on this around the state, and we're getting a lot of interest from uh, local stormwater programs, uh, MS4s with Phase two permits, and also some smaller towns that do not have Phase two permits. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences uh, or about the advantages and disadvantages of that. Uh, what you see here are the six basic components that you have to address in a 4B demonstration. And a lot of these are, have a lot of overlap with the nine elements that you have for an alternative. With really the biggest difference between the two is that the 4B demonstration, you have to do implementation. You have to do it. The five, what we call 5R, or the alternative plans, you do not have to do it because it's technically it's staying on the 303D list. So the di difference between the two that I see it in the big picture is that the 4B, you have to do it, you have to have a schedule to do it, and the 5R or the alternative, you eventually have to do it. And one of the things that we're looking at doing is actually incorporating kind of a pre-TMDL bit of information into our alternative plan so that at some point we could pretty quickly uh, roll out a TMDL if we needed to. So. 4B demonstrations, we did not put any of these into our WQ27 priorities because it's one of those things we have to wait until someone kind of comes to us. And right now we've, we're working with two towns that have come to us and asked us to go through this process with them. And I'm going to show you kind of how we're navigating that in a minute. And what we are doing with our alternative plans, our 5R plans, or what I'm going to call them from now on as a watershed action plan, is we're using that in eight assessment units that are on our Water Quality 27 priority list. And part of what you'll see as I go forward, because of the same things that Heather was talking about, the e economics and staff shortages, we're developing a lot of tools to kind of make that more efficient and also be able to get some more uh, crowdsource uh, components built into that, both for educational purposes and to get people engaged. We also have, with our alternative plans, we're hoping that we can eventually put a path forward so that once we get them started, a local entity could then come in and evolve the 4B or the alternative plan into a 4B demonstration, basically transferring it from a can-do to a have-to-do type, type of approach. The elements or the components between 4B and 5R, there's a lot of overlap in those, and I've kind of condensed those down so that we could 
take the same approach in develop, helping local communities develop 4B demonstrations, as well as internally developing our, our alternative plans or our watershed action plans, kind of using the same process, except one, the 4Bs would be a little more rigorous than the 5R uh, plans or the alternative plans. So advantages of doing the watershed action plans, it's a really quick way, now that we've kind of got our, our feet a little bit wet, it's a really quick way to get restoration plan underway with, with limited resources. The implementation projects, that would be things like 319 grants, and we have a Clean Water Management Trust Fund, but those sorts of activities, they're not required, but we're going to heavily encourage them to be implemented in these planning areas. Um, we are using our watershed action plans to address multiple parameters. We're not just going in and addressing the single parameter that's on the 303D list. We want to address everything, including building out a protection component as well in these plans. And uh, as Heather was saying, EPA finds these acceptable. We're using their, their amenability because it is not a delisting. So the amenability part of it is basically they're saying we can count that towards our WQ27 priority versus what our 4B demonstrations are is a delisting that goes through the local approval process, it goes through our state approval process, and it goes through an EPA approval process. So these plans, I would say, have a little more, have a little more teeth in them, and we will be basically auditing these to make sure that they're being implemented. So our general approach, I'm not going to go through all these. You see money is limited three times there because that's what I keep hearing whenever we try to go through these. Is, uh, and a lot what Heather was saying as well, we have a lot of work that's happening and we're not accounting for it in any kind of meaningful way. We're not leveraging the capacity of our crowdsourcing components. And the biggest thing that we have, and we've experienced this in the past with restoration planning, is that they're complicated and they've been very expensive to develop in the past. And the worst thing is we have not got a lot of implementation out of those plans. So there's a lot of expense put in and not a lot of water quality improvement happening. So here's kind of our uh, current conditions. This is a kind of a graphic I like to use. Uh, we have OK, the OK line, that's the not on the 303D list and the not OK line. And right now we have about 1,261 waters on the 303D list that we need to address. But I also like to put in here that we've got just over 2,000 waters where we have monitoring data where we know things are pretty good and we also want to be able to use this framework to develop protection plans for those, maybe not all in one year or in 100 years, but at some point. And kind of a graphic on what a TMDL does, it kind of gives us the recipe for how much reduction we need to have to get the water quality at least to okay. And unless we have a pretty robust implementation plan to go with that, we're not really sure what the time component would be on that. Now our alternatives, the 4Bs and the watershed action plans, the 4 4B demonstrations, we have a pretty, we, it's kind of built into the, into the cake that we're gonna have a, a deadline or horizon where we expect to meet water quality standards. And then of course along the way, we wanna have interim measures of success. The watershed action plan, Kind of the same thing, except we, we don't start off with the hard schedule of when implementation occurs. We're kind of waiting for opportunity as we come. But we want to make sure that in the watershed action plans that we kind of lay out a path for how we get projects implemented. And also protection plans, to keep the water quality the way it is right now. So some of the problems, and I think Heather touched on this a little bit, some of these plans are required to cover very large areas where we would have oh, thousands of potential fixes that need to be addressed from stormwater control measures to fencing out cattle to um, even, and, and we're not separating point sources from non-point sources, we're going to try to treat them all in the same framework. And the bottom line for us is, as I said just a minute ago, we have a really hard time getting implementation out of these very large planning areas, it's, it's kind of too overwhelming, I think. So we're trying to get small and get more deliberate in how we do this. Um, tracking implementation and plan updates require, and, and previously this would require a lot of resources, including having to call people and figure out what's going on. We're trying to get that down so that it, basically the plans are, are self-reporting. 
We also have trouble getting cooperators and commitments. So we don't have resources, we don't have opportunity, and we don't have capacity. So if we go into a large planning process and identify thousands of stormwater control measures, and then because we don't have opportunity or capacity in the watershed, we only get four or five of them ever put in. So we're trying to eliminate spending a lot of money up front in developing these plans and get that implementation money going sooner rather than later. So this is, I kind of boiled down the six components of the 4B and the nine elements of the nine element plan into kind of this basic step-by-step -step process of the tools and things that we would need in order to make watershed action plans, also 4B plans, implementable and so that we could track them without having to spend a lot of resources and chasing our tails all around. Also, we want to keep this information in the cloud and on web-based mapping applications and not in paper form that someone would have to go dig up. So basically, we'll institutionalize this by storing it in the cloud. And uh, Heather kind of had the same part that I was looking at, is we have watershed action plans, which are kind of laying out the big picture needs that have to happen. And then within those areas, we have implementation plans, and those are 319 grant applications, construction plans, and our 4B areas, our stormwater guys are designing stormwater control measures. And we also want to make sure that we have a, a way to get some good, accurate costing numbers to compare projects with each other. So what we're trying to do is speed up and cost down plan development. It's online map-based, so it's easy to look at. It's space-based. It's self-building, so we don't have to go and identify every single project in the area before we publish the plan. We have the tools in place where people can go identify that stuff as, the, as time progresses. Um, most of the tools that we have are tablet phone-based applications, so you can use these in the field and put dots on the map and answer some questions about what you're looking at depending on what tool you're using. And Right now, we have it set up so that all those elements and components can be addressed with one of these tools. The plans themselves, the maps and the tools, are also serving as our education and outreach tool, and we're working with our environmental education folks to actually develop some K through 8 educational programs that would not only get the kids involved, because as I said, our planning horizons here is that I'll be long dead before some of these get implemented or completed to water quality goals. But if we start off with the kindergartners, maybe in 50 or 60 years, they'll still be engaged in the plan. And when humans have a, you know, a two-week planning horizon, it's really difficult to get them engaged in a, in a restoration effort that could take past their lifetime. We also want to leverage citizen scientists. We've got a lot of watershed groups working in the state that really want to contribute to this, and we've had a hard time getting them engaged because, frankly, it takes a lot of training to do the kind of work we do. So we're kind of, we're kind of taking our tools and turning them into pro versions and then non-pro versions so we could kind of get the most information that we can get. We also kind of went through a process of identifying schools as our main point of focus. Almost all of our watersheds have at least one school in them, and we're trying to get the schools engaged, developing these educational tools. And of course, the kids are way better at using the phone apps than most of the adults are, so maybe they can help their parents get engaged as well. Our general idea is not to spend a lot of resources on the plan itself, but to save those resources for identifying projects and developing projects. Okay, uh, Jasper, can you hand me the ball and see if I can get my screen on here? Uh, yeah, I think if you exit out of full screen and go to um, share. Okay, so you already got me set up. up. Okay, can you see uh, like a map kind of focused on North yeah. Carolina? Yeah, it looks good. We got it? Yep, we got All it. All right, great. So this is an ArcGIS Online uh, project that we put together that basically puts all of our tools for watershed planning in a single place. Now, these can be implemented, used statewide, and depending on if you're doing a 4B plan or an alternative plan or the kind of resources you may have available, you might use some of these tools or all of these tools. 
I won't go through each one, they could take forever, but with the two that we're using to start the plans off are the source and conveyance information tracking system, and it basically is a water body based way to identify potential problem areas and rank them as either it's really it's probably really is a problem or maybe it's not so much of a problem. Let me see if I can get one of these pictures up here. So it asks for it asks quick questions about what the conveyance looks like, where the source type is, like if it's a pasture or if it's roads or parking lots. It takes a look at the flow through the conveyance and the days since last rain, and then we estimate the signal strength. And I have training materials that kind of put this uh, in context for so that we want to make sure that our high signal strength sources are the ones that we need to address first. And then while you're out there, you can also take a picture. Oh, wrong one. Come on, go. And our field observations and assessment tool, this is basically, and this is kind of a non-traditional approach, but this is what we do, we're asking people to use before they do implementation, is to make an assessment so that we can put this into the integrated report. So if someone goes out and there's a bunch of cattle in the stream and they're getting ready to get money to fence those cattle out, then they basically will take in a picture and we'll put it into the integrated report as livestock. So we actually have a parameter called livestock. Now these won't go into category five, they're in, they're in another category. And then at some point after implementation is done, they can go back out and follow up and maybe a year or two later. And then in essence, we have a picture of the livestock on the other side of the fence and livestock is no longer a problem. So we move that to category one. And that way we can track through time in the integrated report how these projects are doing before and after, and it's in the same format as if we were doing a 303D list. They'll show up there as if it were a 303D listing, except not in Category 5. We have a bunch of other tools here. Some of them, most of these we're building in-house. Uh, some of them are existing USGS and EPA tools. Uh, some of them are very citizen science-based, uh, aimed at an audience to get out in the field and take pictures and kind of get get to know their watershed. And a few of them that are a little more, might be tied into a regulatory component, will have in-house training for our staff, and then probably also expand that out to uh, local stormwater staff too as they're starting to develop their plan. Now here's a plan that we already have underway. And I don't know if you've seen story maps before, but basically, it's built with a bunch of frames that we can uh, we have a little blog here that tells people what's going on right now. We started to get some dots on the map. We have an implementation workflow. And the bulk of what we have is we have a little tool that is basically a template for writing your goals, strategies, objectives, and tactics to address the water quality problems that you have. And so it's, it's kind of a boilerplate type of thing, and this one in particular is designed to put restoration plans together in urban, suburban areas that have impaired benthos, which we have about 235 of those. So it's something that we're going to use over and over again, and we kind of lay out all the types of things that you would need to do in order to achieve water the water quality standard. And, and unlike a 4B demonstration where we would have a pretty hard calendar on this, these are phased in, so you do a, um, the objectives, uh, you have a plan phase, initial water uh, watershed action plan, and you have a bunch of objectives that you want to achieve to get the plan rolling. And the next phase is developing an active watershed group. In this case, we don't have one, so we're hoping these tools will help us get one engaged. And then after we have an active group, that's when we really want them to get start using the tools, identifying and prioritizing projects, writing grant proposals to get 319, Clean Water Management Trust Fund money, et cetera, to start implementation of those plans. Another thing that we've put together, and this, this will also be dependent on where you are and who's active in it, but we have roles and responsibilities. 
that so we can clearly define what our division will be doing because we do have limited resources and what we were expecting of the sponsors or the project managers and what we would be expecting from the watershed group. So we kind of lay that out clearly. We also have a tab here for financial resources and then we have a whole set of tools here including the source conveyance, the votes. We have a barrier evaluation tool that's in development to look at, look at uh, culverts and small amenity dams and ponds and things like that to determine whether or not we want to remove those. That's something that we'd work with the watershed group. And we've also developed a way to monetize what we're looking at. So I won't go into any detail on that, but basically we have a, this is an 810 foot reach of stream and we currently have that valued at about $25,000 a year to the total value in North Carolina. It's pretty heavily degraded. Its reference condition would be about $87,000 a year. And this is just a tool that we can use working with the stakeholder group to kind of give them some idea about what's the, what's the return on investment for your project relative to other projects. And what's the overall, give, give people a real idea about what the dollar value is on these streams in these areas. Now, the planning area that I'm working in right now, the pilot area, is very small. It's 1,700 acres. It's about one-tenth of, of the Huck 12 that it's in. It's very small. It's very suburban. It has 1,700 acres and about 1,700 property owners, so a lot of potential stakeholders. Most of the people who live here don't even know this creek is here. So we're hoping that through this process and working with the school, which is right here, that we're going to start engaging stakeholders and start getting some projects identified and start using these, some of these other tools to uh, further develop the plan. Basically, we want to be able to fill out those nine elements as we go. So we're not going out and identifying a property that needs stormwater control measure, doing a design for that, and then finding out that the landowners have zero interest in us being on the property. So we really want to identify the opportunity first and then spend the money on the detailed planning to go get our 319 money or our Clean Water Management Trust Fund money. These tools will, some of them are already rolling out to the public and are being used right now. Uh, others of them we are piloting. There's about 17 of them. Some of them are more for fun. Some of them are for actually getting data together that we can use to compare project locations. And we also have, we have the one plan template for the Benthos, but we're developing others that are more like a traditional TMDL looking template, although we're not going to call it a TMDL until such time that we need to call it a TMDL. And that is all I have. Of, hopefully by end of summer this will be public and I can send this out to the larger group and you can explore whether or not you might want to use or abuse some of our tools if you think they might work for you. Great. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, one of the questions that came in was actually if this was available to the public. Um, I guess it will be in the summer, he said? Yes. Yeah, most of the tools will be available uh, sometime over the summer. And uh, the one that you can play with right now is the skits tool, but you have to download Survey123 on your phone, and then you can go search for it. And I control the amount of data that gets used up, so if people want to test it in their state, they're welcome to, but if we start pushing on our data cap, I'll have to remove your data, so don't, don't think of it as a permanent tool. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, so typically, who identifies and initiates TMDLs and 4B projects and uh, WAPs? Is it local or state? The, the WAPs are being initiated by us right now, the state, as part of our Water Quality 27 measure, but we're encouraging other folks outside of those priority areas to also develop plans. Uh, we're getting a lot of interest by the cities to kind of, they're already doing a lot of the work that you would be doing under a 4B demonstration, and they kind of want to formalize that. And one of the, one of the things that's been a stopper, especially for the small towns, is the tracking, reporting, 
of all the stuff that they're doing is difficult for them to do because of IT resources. So we're basically going to kind of fill that gap and let them do their implementation, and we're giving them some easy tools to track their projects. And also for us, because if we're doing 4B audits, we want to be able to just go to our 4B site and see what everybody's doing and send that on to Region 4 as well. The TMDLs, which we don't, not something we do a lot of right now, those are prioritized basically on whether or not we have uh, point sources and permits involved that we can get more leverage with the TMDL rather than a watershed action plan. We do have one that we're developing right now that's going to be a watershed action plan that will probably include a natural conditions assessment, a, a benthos recovery plan, a TMDL, and uh, a protection plan. So we'll house all of that into one watershed action plan, but it could you could have some Category 4B, could Category 4A, Category 3, Category 5 all mixed into the same plan with slightly different approaches, but we want to kind of integrate all that into, in, into one box. All right. Um, how do you deal with uh, permitted issues such as stormwater? The way that we're doing it right now, um, we have one, if you want to take a look at a really good 4B demonstration, look for uh, Little Alamance Creek. Uh, they have a website, and basically the way that we're operating is that they have, they have their stormwater permit, so they have stuff they have to do, and the 4B demonstration basically is going beyond that. So for funding purposes, if they want to get, we've, we've given them 319 money, but only for things that are outside of their permit, so true restoration work that they wouldn't necessarily have to do as part of their permit. All right, um, are there any other questions for Cam? And as a reminder, there will be a longer Q&A section at the end. All right, um, not seeing any at this time, so um, all right, uh, thanks, Cam. And now we will move on to uh, Scott Heidel in Pennsylvania. Um, here you go, Scott. Okay. So basically, I think everyone really hit the whole um, state approach to alternative plants. So I'm actually going to drill down and give an example of one particular one that we've done here. It's actually our first one in Pennsylvania and I believe Region 3 as well. And with that, I definitely want to give thanks to Region 3. Um, Ashley Toy was very instrumental in helping us to develop this process. And Mifflin County Conservation District is the local county that it was in place at. So here's a regional view. Pennsylvania up there and the white delineation is the Kishikoquillis watershed and that's a tributary to the Juniata River and which flows on to the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay so it's part of the gigantic headwater area of the Chesapeake Bay. So here's um, more of a bird's eye view of the watershed. You have some really steep slopes going into the, the basin edges and in those mountains and ridges there, you have some really fantastic trout fisheries, excellent aquatic life. It's, as you can see, very well forested and pristine. Then when you get into the valley, you have karst geology, so there's a good bit of calcium carbonate. Gives you some interesting hydrology, but one thing that it really does as well is it flattens out that valley floor and provides a lot of nutrients, um, calcium carbonate for the agricultural uh, croplands. So this area has been in agricultural production for literally over a few hundred years. And it's also home to the Plainsect um, Amish community, which has very traditional tillage and cons conservation practices are uh, minimal at this point. So hope to discuss the um, 
CMDL process versus what we're calling the alternative restoration plans, our listing processes, the modeling that goes into creating a CMDL or an alternative plan, and then phased restoration that we're using for our plans, and then the funding for it, grants and WIPs, and then as this all progresses, we're doing continuing monitoring and the adaptive management approach. So what we found is non-point source pollution is the leading source of pollution, and that's agriculture and abandoned mine drainage in Pennsylvania. And um, one thing that's difficult with that is that there really are no permits to reduce. So these are non-point source, sources of pollution, and they don't really have a permit process that we can really um, go in and, and reduce their numbers through a permit. So you have to get a little bit more creative here. That's what makes them uh, more difficult. So the original form of TMDLs that we were writing, basically like pollution diets, capping off the maximum daily load of a pollutant that that waterway could basically process through with still having a, um, a viable aquatic community that lives there. Um, what we found is we wrote a whole lot of these and they resulted in very few delistings. That mainly was a, a process of the consent decree pace. Um, if anyone really knows the history of the TMDLs, we I think nationally we're taken to court for not implementing TMDLs um, once waterways were listed as impaired. So there was a big push to get a whole bunch of them written um, due to that court uh, decision. So they were kind of blasted out rather than really, really um, getting down into what would make a TMDL a functional tool to get a delisting happen. So what this is with these alternatives it's actually taking it to that pollution diet and implementing the diet to um, what I was calling make weight uh, wrestling in the past. So that's a term that we had always used to make it into your weight class. So um, what we've done there is connect vested partners, use targeted BMP implementation, and again to hit, um, hit on everything that everyone has been saying earlier with the nine elements, it's very similar to a whip, more of like a hybridized TMDL whip. So here are the particular listings for this watershed. You can see that agriculture is the big source of the pollution with 60 miles of the watershed listed for nutrients. Um, that would be total phosphorus, as well as 85 of those miles being um, listed for silpation. And then you have a, a couple of the minimal things. So with the modeling for non-point source pollution, sediment, nutrients, we do not have numeric cri criteria. So we use a reference watershed approach. We find a watershed that's similar in size, land uses, geology, um, physiographic province, things like that, soil type, slope. And then the big thing is it has to be attaining its designated uses and similar in designated uses. We model that watershed. We model the impaired watershed, and we apply the loading rate of the attaining watershed to the land area of the impaired watershed to come up with the, T the TMDL. So that's how we set the diet. And then where the ARPs take it a little bit further is that we do BMP scenario runs to actually get it to that load allocation and to make weight. So with this, we're restoring it in phases. It, the upper Kish has two sub-watersheds within it. Um, the upper Kish larger watershed as well as Hungry Run, which is another sub-watershed of the Kish Coquillus. Those two watersheds have their own implementation plans and they've had them for almost 10 years now. So we're calling that basically what's been done so far according to those plans, what's actually been implemented to date. And then phase one BMPs, we're calling that bringing them up to regulatory compliance. So that would be doing a lot of 
outreach and education of the farmers in the area to help them get conservation plans written and established and implemented. Those are also known as erosion and sediment control plans, as well as getting their nutrient management plans in place. Phase two BMPs, this is where it gets a little bit more specific to the watershed. We actually targeted the specific source sectors of the, the heavy hitters of pollution. So croplands in this watershed were loading very high. The BMPs were implemented to target those cropland runoff. So another heavy hitter was the stream banks because you have a few legacy sediments in there from previous mill dams that have since been breached but had uh, layered up a, a good bit of sediment over the years. So the stream banks are eroding and why they're really eroding badly is because that's basically the pasture area as well. So we're trying to get the cows out of the stream, do some stream stabilization, get some buffers implemented. And um, on the phase two, it's, like I said, very targeted for the impairments of that specific watershed. And that's years five to 10. So this is basically an aggregate of the existing conditions and then the existing conditions to date with the WIP BMP implementation, phase one, bringing them up to speed to regulatory compliance, and then the allowable load, that would be your load allocation um, that we've come up with using the reference watershed approach. And then phase two, that's your targeted BMP implementation to get you under that allowable load. So as you can see on the current load, that's modeling with the animals calibrated into the model, um, and all the, the existing conditions on the ground, you're looking at about 60,000 pounds of sediment a day flowing off of that watershed. So with the BMPs that were put in place so far with the two whips and their uh, bolded Hungry Run and Upper Kish, you're looking at a load reduction of about 12,000 of that or 21%. Phase one, once we get everybody up to speed implementing their ENS plans and their nutrient management plans, you're going to see a further reduction. So the 18,000 takes into account the original 12,000 from the WIP load as this is an ongoing aggregate. So that brings you another 30% reduction. So then your allowable load is calling for a 36% reduction from the existing load. So we're nearly there once we get to the end of phase one. So phase two is those targeted BMPs to get you over that finish line, and that will eventually result in a 56% reduction, clearly surpassing the 36% reduction called for. So how are we paying for all this? Federal funds, like 319, as I said, Upper Kish and Hungry Run already have whips. Um, they're 10 years old plus. So one thing that made this alternative TMDL really, really interesting and doable was that the Mifflin County Conservation District, where the Kishikokulis Creek watershed is, has been working with these WIPs, implementing BMPs, but really didn't know where they stood as far as their load reductions went per source sector. So we did a lot of modeling with them, calibrated the model with the BMPs that they have, already put in place, and then did some further theoretical model runs with the BMPs that they plan to put in place as well, and found that they're very close to meeting the load reductions called for for croplands. They have a good bit of work to do with stream banks as well as with pasture lands and with their um, waste management systems associated with the animal populations there because there's a lot of CAFOs. So buddying up with 319, as Cam mentioned earlier, is definitely the way to go with um, non-point source agricultural T TMDL alternatives as far as what we've found so far. So another source of federal funding would be USDA. And then we have state funding sources here at DEP, the Growing Greener grant funds and things like that. So as this 
progresses on, we need to monitor. So in order to monitor nutrients, we look at things like dissolved oxygen, temperature, and pH, and you measure that pre-dawn and afternoon to find your diurnal swings. So in order to show progress, on a nutrient impairment, you want those DO swings to be minimal. minimal. So you want to tighten those swings. Um, for sediment, we use pebble counts, and you'll actually be able to chart through time a change from fines to more coarse. Um, we also call it watching the rocks grow over time because the fines are processed through normal stream dynamics once it becomes restored and you find the, the base load um, is a replacement of sand with more uh, beneficial gravel that provides interstitial spaces for macroinvertebrates and fish. And then with the aquatic life, electrofishing is one of the best things to show progress right away because fish will come back into these streams faster than the macroinvertebrates will recolonize. So tracking your uh, fisheries biology is, is super important to demonstrate progress. And then, of course, since the aquatic life um, assessment was done using the macroinvertebrate IBI, we're, we're going to monitor macroinvertebrates as well. So here's an example of monitoring some of the nutrient uh, impacts taking measures of DO, pH, and temperature over time with these data loggers, SON. And here's a, a display of the DO, pH, and temperature of a nutrient-impaired example. So on the bottom, you can see your water temperature. It goes to the bottom, goes lower at night, then it rises up during the daytime because the sun's hitting it, and then it drops back down at night and rises the next day. So if you go up to the top, you can see that DO is also rising as the sun and temperature are rising. So that's telling you that it's photosynthetic rather than a natural forested stream channel. And along with that, the pH is rising and falling with the uh, DO and the temperature. And that's all driven by photosynthesis and algal functionality. So here's an example of an attaining non-nutrient impaired stream. On the bottom, you can see the temperature as it rises, the DO drops off. And that's what you would expect. Solved oxygen is more soluble at lower temperatures, so as the water increases, you're going to see that dropping off. Um, the pH remains extremely stable. So there's not really, this is not photosynthetic driven, and you're seeing a more natural um, ecosystem response here. And another thing that's worth pointing out is that that DO swing in this slide is around 2. On the previous slide, it was 10. So anything above, like, around a 5, you're starting to see nutrient impairment. And here's an example of pebble counts. These are three of our previous interns. Um, one person's grabbing some pebbles, handing it over to another person who's measuring it with the gauge, and then someone's logging it down. And we do that at random sites throughout the watershed to um, track the progress and the changes with the substrate. And the original IBI uh, that was used to list will also, the same process will be used for delisting as well as monitoring. And the aquatic life use surveys um, 90% of our waters that are classified as impaired are based off these surveys. They collect the insects, macroinvertebrates, and then identify them at the lab and then form your IBI. So here's some of the past IBIs done by the conservation district as well as a local um, college in that area. So the green is showing progress. The red is showing um, that it's not making progress. Unfortunately, there's only one that's red. Um, the rest do show progress. The problem is there's still a lot to be done. Those scores are pretty low, but they are moving in the right direction. And hopefully we can get those to a place where they're going to be attaining here soon. So here's an example of a source of impairment. 
the cattle had free access to the stream um, pretty much throughout the watershed. So um, a lot of fencing has been put in place. A lot of cattle have been taken out of direct contact with the water. And that does two things. It, it helps the environment there locally as well as downstream, but it also increases herd health. And our hopefully our next alternative TMDL is going to be on a stream in Lancaster County, which is our agricultural hub in Pennsylvania. Uh, the project there on Fishing Creek is doing a study to analyze herd health associated with the removal of cows from this unhealthy, muddy, loaded with their own feces type uh, mess. So they're trying to equate milk profitability and quality being increased by herd health increase um, by removing the cattle from this, this uh, mess that they're standing in right here. So here's post BMP, same pasture, got the cows out. The trees aren't quite growing yet, but as you can see, there's some ducks in the stream. It's uh, certainly a different habitat now. The bugs are increasing, the fishery is responding as well. And this is what's taking place in this watershed now. They're getting a lot of progress with getting the cows out of the stream and doing some further cropland um, BMPs as well. So as this all evolves, we're using the adaptive management approach. Um, and that includes implementing the, uh, the WIPs, the watershed implementation plans, and doing updates as we move forward, um, hopefully at least on a 10-year basis um, and that includes modeling to see where you're at with your VMPs to date, what still, what source sectors really need to be targeted, and then to target those. And any time that you put BMPs on the ground, especially fencing and cattle crossings that are susceptible to um, extreme flows, hitting them, anything like that, you need to have an O&M component, operation and maintenance, so that the cost of that is not um, basically put on to the farmer or the landowner because if you want to not have participation, participation in this, you can drop a whole bunch of prices and costs on top of your landowners that you've been trying very hard to get on board. So you got to take care of that. Um, basically the county is taking care of, care of all of that, so it takes that burden off of the landowners so that we can have a lot of involvement because without their support, we can't put these BMPs in place. And then as things move on, we do monitoring and then hopefully we're going to get some delistings out of this. And here's all my contact information if anybody has any questions as they come up down the road. And that's about it for that. Thanks, Scott. Uh have a question that came in. Um, has actual monitoring on the streams discussed confirmed model reduction for waste loads? So far, the monitoring that we're doing is showing that we're getting some reductions. Um, but when you're looking at large scale watershed modeling, it's going to take time until this really gets in place. Um, one thing that was touched on earlier, I believe in Cam's talk, was looking at some of the smaller watersheds. Within this Kish Creek watershed, Kish Coquillis Creek watershed, there are a number of smaller sub-watersheds that we're focusing on all of the, the small impairments within those and prioritizing them as basically in a targeted process so that you focus on one watershed that's small and manageable, has a, a smaller set of landowners, you can get implementation at a fairly rapid pace, and there you're going to see it. With the upper Kish being as large as it is, it's going to take more time until these BMPs, especially the buffers, get mature enough to actually see a response. So while we are seeing progress, it's not as crystal clear as you would hope that it would be. But as time progresses, I think that those lines are going to tighten up and it will demonstrate what we're hoping to see. All right. Um, 
Are you able to identify what the acceptable ranges for pH and DO swings are in nutrient impaired streams? I think that really goes back to our water quality standards. So we do have criteria for that. And that depends on the designated use of the stream. So basically anything outside of six and nine for pH, less than six or higher than nine, that would be a violation. And then DO, that's really specific to whether it's cold water fishery, warm water fishery, um, high quality trout stream, things like that. But yeah, we, we already do have criteria for that. All right. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about how you engaged the county to cover the O&M? They had already planned for that and had written that into their watershed implementation plan. Mifflin County is a very proactive county, and they've done some incredible things over the years with restoring their waterways. So we're actually kind of learning as we go and working with them. That's what makes this really neat is that it's kind of a, a hybridized process with the 319 group, the county conservation district and TMDLs. And with this being our first one, having them as such a vested and interested and driven partner, we're seeing some really, really um, good progress. But I have to give them uh, definitely credit for that. But Certainly, moving forward, I, I would not design any type of an implementation plan without O&M written into it. Okay, um, we got one more for Scott at the moment. Um, I'd also like to just let people know that um, after this next question, we can open it up to questions for both Scott and Cam. Um, Heather had to uh, take off for another commitment, um, but you can also, if you have any follow-up questions for Heather in North Dakota, you can use the uh, uh, exit survey as a chance to send in any follow-up questions. Um, but also for Scott, if a watershed has not um, has no TMDL for your pollutant. Um, the 319 program requires a TMDL-like level of analysis to ensure the watershed plan will result in meeting the standards. Um, and so that's actually so that's actually a question for Cam, um, just because Scott addressed how you handled that. So um, yeah, I'll try that one more time. So for Cam, um, if a watershed does not have a TMDL for your pollutant, and the 319 program requires a TMDL-like level of analysis. Um, how does your, how do you handle that in terms of meeting the standards? Uh, we work with our 319 staff to make sure that our watershed action plans cover all the information that they need to have in order to get projects implemented in those areas. Right now, we require, in order to get 319 funding, you have to be implementing a, a watershed plan, nine element plan, a 4B or whatever. So we're using this, these watershed action plans to basically increase the areas of the state where 319 grants can be uh, implemented. So it's not the level of a TMDL, but we're somewhere in between, I guess. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Give it maybe another 20 seconds and then move on. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other, oh, got one more, last second. Um, what is the level of detail that you expect in your non-point source watershed-based plans? And as far as whether additional information would be needed to implement restoration activities? And that's for whoever wants to take it. 
I can try and take a stab at that one. Um, basically, we try and analyze everything about the watershed that we can that would demonstrate what the hot spots of the impairments are. So we'll go to the watershed, actually meet with the local experts and tour the watershed and then calibrate our model accordingly. So we try to, to really, really get the best model built and then calibrated and then we'll come up with really, really um, detailed ideas of exactly where the pollutants are coming from, what their dynamics are, and then how to target those through BMP implementation. I would think though that when you put your plan together, if you get too detailed, it could limit you if you say have a property owner change or a change in mood in a certain area where they had cattle and then just decided they don't have cattle anymore. Now they have crops, but they're tilling right up to the stream bank. So you have to be sort of careful how far down into the the details that you get, but certainly find those hot spots and identify methods to remediate them. We're we're trying to avoid doing a lot of detailed work up front, kind of for the reasons that, that Scott was saying, but also the resource issue. So we want to we really want to outline that restoration needs to happen and get as much information as we can as easily as we can into the plan, but we really want the local stakeholders to get engaged in doing the, the detail work of identifying the hot spots and areas where projects can be done so that we don't, we don't want to go out and get a bunch of information ahead of time only to find out two years later that, like you said, and you know, one of our problems is the, the cows are gone and now it's a subdivision. So that's kind of, we have kind of that issue where we don't want to get too too much resource spent up front only to have that kind of uh, come apart on us later on. So we're trying to just do the minimum amount that we can do in order for our 319 and other folks to be comfortable that they can grant money in there and it'll be tracked and the water quality will get better. All right, great. Um, so that's going to be the end of today's webinar. Um, thank you everyone for joining and a special thanks to our speakers for great, present for great presentations. Um, please keep an eye out for the next webinar in this series, which should be sometime in June on TMDL revisions. And uh, please fill out the exit survey once you close the window. Uh, thanks again for joining and have a good day.